we take lots of photos in life, and we do it for many reasons. One is to remember important events. And this, to me, is the most important photo to me. It's my family and I after brain surgery. But we can also use and share photos for many other reasons, such as my friends really enjoyed sharing these photos, which are probably the worst graduation photos <laughs> possible. So people share photos all the time. And in today's age, we do selfies all the time. And so, for example, I'm here right now. I have a camera on me, and you're there. And I'm the last speaker before a little bit of a food break, so I figured this would be fun. Let's take a selfie together, and I want you to do a goofy pose, and I'm going to do a goofy pose, OK? Feel free to stand up, wave your arms, do something. All right, ready? Everybody ready? Let me flip that around. OK. All right, woohoo. All right, thank you. I'll share that with you later on Twitter if you're interested. And so with photos, that's a perfect example of how when the tools are simple, we like to capture, use, and share data. And the selfie movement shows that extremely. But what about with our medical data? How come we can't easily access it, use it, and share it? So a lot of people think selfies are selfish. But today I'm going to ask the question, could selfies save us? And so I'm talking about a medical selfie. And we probably don't know what a medical selfie is, so I'm going to go back to that original photo and show it to you as a medical selfie. So if we zoom in, here's my repaired skull. This is my brain. Down to the MRI scans, that's my tumor. And then into the actual surgery of my brain. If we dive down into the astrocytoma, we can actually see the mutant IDH1 protein. And behind that is my actual genome. And for this primary mutation, it's a single point mutation. It's a G that turned to an A. So that, in 20 seconds, all drained from standard medical data, explains my story. And I can share it, and I can understand it. And yes, this is what my brain looked like last summer. And this is an active situation for me. I'm in my seventh month of chemo. I've got five months of chemo left. Um, and selfies can be pictures like this, but they can also be 3D representations. This is much easier to understand that the tumor was actually about 10% of my brain behind my left eyeball. And selfies don't just have to be images. They can be physical things. So for example, uh, here's a copy of, of the actual tumor. This is what they cut out from behind my left eyeball. And as I, I show in Saul, I hollowed it out, and you can actually fill it up with salt and then use it as, <laughs> as a salt shaker. Um, and so you know, imagine going to the hospital for your MRI scan or your x-ray and being able to press on your iPhone, you know, 3D print my skull. You know, pay your $50, you get this. And then to understand how they do the surgery, they can say, well, we're actually going to cut out this part of your skull. We're going to go in. We're going to pull out that tumor, right? And so there's this huge power um, of being able to use and interact and share that data for so many reasons. Um, so we, if we make that data available, patients can make selfies in terms of fabrication. But we can also do selfies such as uh, in the proton radiation machine, I took images of my brain with protons at millions of miles per hour. And on the research side, I was able to look at new ways of printing with multi-materials, such as in the future, could medical students dissect themselves, printed versions of themselves, with real feelings of stiffness and skin. So all kinds of exciting stuff. And as a patient, I can actually go in and see my cancer. This is actually a piece of my brain that I was able to uh, cut, stain, and image. And yes, this is a true selfie. I took it of myself. And you know, if we're able to share these images, we could have crowdsourced medical solutions. We could have new algorithms coming up. Um, we could have in enormous benefits for medical science and for hospitals. So that's what I'm talking about today, is could sharing our medical selfies save us? And what are, are the benefits for patients, but not just patients, for hospital, for medical science? I'm going to tell you why I think the future is in patient-centric healthcare. But first, let me explain why I'm here. Uh, and it's mainly because of curiosity. Everyone is curious, especially in this room. And we're all curious when we're young. And so when I was actually growing up, I was looking at my brain when I was 10 years old. And that curiosity led me to MIT. And this is, uh, I work as a PhD student under Professor Neri Oxman and David Wallace. 
and I work on how to make things. And this ranges from buildings to bacteria. This is actually a house scale 3D printer that can actually go around and print with insulation and concrete. And not only that, we can actually print with um, metal for rebar, and we can print with glass, and we can actually get down to the micro scale and actually use it to control biology. We can actually put in bacteria into these 3D printed microfluidics, and we can make them wearable. We can have uh, use uh, biology as the next design tool. So that's what I do on my research side, but that's not what I'm here to talk about today. I'm here to talk about this personal story. And what unites it all is a, a sense of curiosity. So I'm a huge dork. I'm the biggest <laughs> dork, and that's why I'm at MIT. And when I was in um, college, I wanted to see my brain, so I volunteered for a research study. And it was actually a study looking at fear response. So I laid inside this MRI, and they showed me pictures of spiders, and I asked for the data of my brain afterwards. And they said, by the way, there's a small abnormality in your frontal left lobe. You want to get checked out. So I said, OK, great. And if you actually look, it's in the top right-hand corner there. And I got it rechecked uh, by doctors in 2007. They said, don't worry. We don't know what this is, but let's monitor it. So I went back in 2010, had another scan done, and it hadn't changed. The doctors weren't concerned. They said, you know, a lot of people have abnormalities that will never affect them. I said, great. Um, then last summer, uh, I started to smell a very faint vinegar smell for a couple seconds. And it happened about three days in a row. Um, and I actually went back and I looked at this data, and I actually realized that abnormality is near the smell center of my brain. And so I went to the doctors, and they said, well, we're not really concerned about this. Don't, don't worry. But I pushed, and I said, there's this data that we have. It shows maybe this abnormality is linked. Maybe there's a connection. And so they booked an MRI, but they didn't for, do it for a month because there was no concern. And this is what it looked like. So the tumor had grown to take up a very, very large chunk of my frontal left lobe. And uh, if it seems like I don't have much personality, it's because a lot of people think the personality is in the frontal left lobe. So I apologize if I'm being <laughs> a little dry. Um, they cut it out. But, you know, it, it was, I was basically a completely asymptomatic, just like you guys are right now, probably. And then in three weeks, I had 10% of my brain cut out. And it was done in an awake brain surgery. So I was talking like this. And the reason for that is it was near my language center, and they wanted me to continue to talk throughout the surgery. So when my voice would garble, they would avoid cutting out those regions. So I had an amazing surgical team led by Dr. Ino Kiyoka at Brigham and Women's Hospital. And because I'm a dork and curious, I wanted to see what was going to happen to me. So I asked if it could be videotaped, and they said, sure. And so I'm going to ask you, are you curious to see it? OK, good, because I'm going to warn you, it is graphic. <laughs> it is graphic. So I'm going to show you a 30-second times a sped up version of this 10-hour surgery. Close your eyes if you don't want to see it. It's going to be graphic. And if you listen carefully, you'll hear me talking about how I met my girlfriend um, throughout the surgery. So here I'm, I'm awake to make the initial cuts. And if you listen carefully, hey, talk to us again. This is me speaking. Uh, not ready in uh, a clock of 209. And so they go in, there's the tumor, they're moving out, and now they're screwing me back together. And it was this incredibly surreal experience to feel them inside my brain uh, while they're doing the operation. So uh, my medical team was amazing, and the surgery went very well. I was very lucky. This is before and after. And it was three days later, and I was back on campus. Um, very, very lucky. So um, huge. That yeah, that applause is definitely for the doctors. They uh, were so fantastic and amazing, uh, and I'm so grateful. Um, I did proton radiation uh, at MGH, and the most ex interesting thing for me is what I learned. And I'm not going to dive into the details, but it was over 100 gigabytes of data. Um, and, and if you want to learn more, if you're curious, it's all on my website, and you can find out everything you want to know about my brain. Um, but the, the, the most fascinating thing was the process of getting it. And I came up, it was a question um, that really perplexed me of how come I had the least access to my own data? Why was there were so many barriers in the way? And small barriers in a hospital are mountains to patients. Uh, why was it complex? Hundreds of pages of scanned PDFs. And how come there were so many legal gray areas? And as an example, I still don't have access to my genomic sequence data. 
So there was a study done between my hospital and my university, and they were looking to do whole tumor sequencing. So I volunteered and offered up my tumor because I'm happy to help science. And on the informed consent, it listed a way for patients to access data. So I was thrilled, going to be helping science and I get my own genome. Um, the sequencing is done. My doctors can see it. My university colleagues can see it. Um, but I still can't. Uh, it's been an ongoing legal discussion for the last several months. And it's because of policy issues. Um, so how come they can see my future and I can't? I gave them a piece of my brain, and all I want to see is just the same data they're seeing. What if I want to open source it? I want to help medical research. How come I can't even see my own, my own sequence? So I started giving uh, talks on this because I met a professor at MIT who studies the IDH1 mutation and asked me to give a five-minute perspective talk. And it, actually opened up this amazing opportunity, found a great response, and ended up in a New York Times article. Um, and it was published on April 1st, which is April Fool's, which is my favorite holiday, actually, believe it or not. Um, and that day, I got over 1,000 emails. And in the weeks to follow, thousands more. And they were from patients, from doctors, and from researchers. And they all said, this matters. And so I did 49 days of combined protons and chemotherapy. And the first day after treatment, I was actually invited to the White House for President Obama's precision medicine announcements. And I got to be honest, I was worried about setting off the Geiger counters going in <laughs> because it was the first day post-treatment. Um, but it was an incredible experience. And of course, I had to take a selfie because I like documenting things. And I was very excited. <laughs> As you can see, I was thrilled. Um, and it, made me start asking the question more and more, why can't we have a hospital share button? Why can't we have simple tools? And it wouldn't just benefit the patient, it would actually help friends and family understand what I was going through. It would help doctors to have engaged patients, researchers could have data with context, and hospitals could use the feedback to optimize and save cost. We need to make healthcare a two-way street. And to show you that what's left of my brain is not completely crazy, there's some precedence here. So Open Notes was a, a study done involving three major hospitals where they let all the patients see full access to the doctor's notes on them. And they found after one year, 99% of patients wanted continued access. Four out of five said they would choose their provider based on having that access. And 70% reported taking better care of themselves. And most importantly, all of the hospitals expanded these programs. Now, what about sharing? Would people actually share medical data? Well, yes, if the tools are simple enough, such as if we look at Apple Research Kit, which launched earlier this summer, it's a way to share medical data over your phone. Within the first week, 50,000 people joined. And over 75% of them opted to share all of their data with medical researchers not just within the app, but to any researcher. Uh, so if the tools are simple, people will share. Um, and people are always asking me this question, well, is too much data damaging? And yes, it's very important that it's up to the patients. Right? We want to make sure if you don't want to share anything, you don't have to. But if you want to share and you understand the liabilities, then you should be allowed to. And every decision we make has liabilities. When you post something on Facebook or Twitter, there's liabilities. When you get in your car or you cross the street, there's liabilities. But what we need is patients as partners. Patients as partners in their own care, right? So we need access that's patient-centric and it's clear. And to start with, we need a key to the data. We need a public API. And an API is an application programming interface which would let you send your data. So at the hospital, instead of having to send in a request and wait in the mail for three weeks and get 30 CDs, you could press a button on your smartphone and say, you know, send this to patients like me or send this to Cancer Commons. Um, so that's what we really need is a, a key because we could then use capitalism to drive innovation. We could have things like a Google Maps for health. We could have a Facebook, a Dropbox for health. And the possibilities are incredible. We could cure disease by sharing our data. You could become a co-author, one of thousands of co-authors, by pressing a button on your phone saying, share my blood work. 
or share my MRI scan, right? We could have smartwatches that'll save your life, could diagnose you. And we're not talking a million people, we're talking over a billion. So there's amazing potential here. And I'm not even um, talking about the potential for support. And this is critical, and um, I can personally tell you that support can be the most important medicine. A lot of researchers don't realize that. When I was going through this, I posted all my data online, and my friends and family sent me videos in response. And I had three weeks when I was diagnosed before I had the surgery, and this is the video I got to see the day before my surgery, which included somehow they got samples from one of my favorite TV shows. Happy brain surgery, Steve. Hey, Steve, it's Jimmy Kimmel. We hope you get better. Happy brain surgery to you. Happy brain surgery to you. And so it was, you know, this incredible ability to have support, and that can really make a patient, uh, can act as medicine. And so I want to end on a very personal note. Um, I want to first say to you, let's stay curious and ask your doctor about your data. Um, I want to thank my family and my medical doctors for saving my life um, and the researchers that I work with. And because I'm a huge dork, I have to put the references in. <laughs> and um, <laughs> I, I want to end on a very personal note. So switch shoes with me for a second. Imagine you're just as I was last summer, feeling normal, and then on a random Tuesday you're told in three weeks we're going to cut out 10% of your brain. So I sent an email out to friends and family, and I wanted to read you the last three sentences I wrote from that email, uh, which I sent out right before. Perspective is everything, and switching shoes yields the most powerful thoughts. Family and friends are what remain when the world blurs. Gather data as often as possible and share it with the world. It could save your life one day. I never would have gone to the neurological folks if I didn't have the open data from the research scan. And the last sentence that I wrote in that email was, the world is a lovely, splendid, and fascinating place. But most of all to me, it's beautifully curious. So with that, I want to say thank you.